Today we're going to talk about the properties of water. Water is really interesting. We've already discussed in the previous lecture about how its structure leads to it being a polar molecule. So remember we drew the Lewis structure, which means it has individual bond dipoles, and all in all that this molecule is polar. And so it's got its partial negative sides and its partial positive sides. But that's not the only thing that's interesting about water. Its structure makes it a wonderful solvent, probably one of the most commonly used solvents in the world. There are other interesting properties about water that are just as interesting. So as we're talking about each of these properties, think back to the last lecture and how that might have an effect on solubility and that kind of thing. So begin with, what happens whenever you take water and you put it in the freezer? It freezes. So if you maybe, you probably have noticed that if you stick like an ice cube tray into the freezer, what happens to the water? It always kind of expands up and out of the ice cube tray and so they almost, even if you had them all perfectly separated when you stuck them in the freezer, they're going to be kind of a solid on the top. And so the reason for that is that whenever water forms into ice, this crystalline structure forms which actually opens up space and that's what causes the water to expand. So let's look closely, more closely at that structure. So down here at the bottom picture, what you're seeing here is, first of all, the skate blades on top, and then you've got ice or water that's in the liquid form, and then below that you have water that's in the solid form as ice. And what you see here is a whole bunch of hydrogen bonding that's drawn. So individual molecules and hydrogen bonding between them. Now if you remember from our previous lecture, because it has that partial positive and partial negative, that if you have two water molecules in solution next to each other, then naturally the oxygens are going to want to align with the hydrogens and vice versa. And so that's what forms your hydrogen bond, is either the negative charges on the oxygens want to align with the positive charges on the hydrogens. And so whenever it's doing that, whenever it's in the liquid form, all of these molecules are just freely floating. So a positive finds a negative, it kind of says hello and then it lets go and it goes find another negative. Whenever it's in the solid form, once it finds its partner, it's correlating other opposite charge, it sticks. And so that's what forms this pretty crystal structure that you see here, where you have these open spaces in between all of the atoms. And so no longer do you have all of these molecules just freely flowing and therefore pretty close together. Whenever they're forming these strong hydrogen bonds, they're pushing each other out, if you will, and forming this nice pretty lattice. And so what happens is ice is one of the random, very rare um, liquids that forms a less dense form structure in the solid phase than it does in the water phase because normally whenever you have something that's a solid it's actually more dense than the water phase okay and then you know about gas gas is the least dense of them all and you know we're not violating that rule at all so what's interesting is whenever you've got ice skating which you've shown here is you actually have a thin layer of water that forms on top of the surface of the ice and that's simply due to the fact that this hydrogen bonding slowly breaking down and so then you have the small film of the ice. And so if you watch and you watch those Zamboni machines clean the ice, what are they actually doing? They're melting the ice and reforming that nice clean edge right on the top. And so no matter how cold you think you have your ice, you still have a tiny little layer of water on the surface. So what that means is at the molecular level, you're having a little bit of melting and freezing going on simultaneously. So at zero degrees, this rate of freezing and melting of ice are equal. As you go colder, then you're going to obviously have the rate of freezing be greater than the rate of melting. As you go warmer, the opposite. And so what's neat is all of these molecules that are in the liquid water phase, as they come close to the ice, they could freeze and get kind of trapped in to that lattice structure and form part of the crystal or if they get a little bit of energy, they can melt and reform the random dispersal that occurs in the liquid phase. About freezing, what you have to do is you either have to remove heat 
remove the heat from it, or slow the motion of the molecules. Now those are kind of redundant, because if you're removing heat, you are going to be slowing the motion of the molecules because you're removing energy from the system. And so what that does is by slowing these molecules down, it allows them to align themselves more perfectly and to form a hydrogen bond. So the idea here is, is as you slow them down, as you remove energy, once they find that oppositely charged portion of this neighboring molecule, it kind of stays in that position and forms a hydrogen bond. And it's that hydrogen bond that holds it together. Now remember, hydrogen bond is simply a dipole-dipole attraction of hydrogen to a highly electronegative atom. And in the case of water, oxygen is the one we're referring to. So the idea is that these hydrogen bonding is what holds ice into its pretty crystalline form. So for instance, what happens in the winter if we want to keep our roads from freezing? What do you often see them going out on the roads with? Huge old salt trucks. Now the thing is, it used to be a lot of just simply sodium chloride, but since then we've used a whole lot of other different molecules. And pretty much, you can use any molecule you want, well, you know, if it's affordable and um, and easily accessible. You can use a lot of things to simply add to water and if you're adding them to the liquid form of water then what's going to happen is as it tries to turn into ice because the temperature is lowering these individual um, salt molecules or you know some people use like beet juice as a new common thing or you can actually use sugar um, those individual other molecules will get in the way and instead of allowing the water molecules to form and become part of the crystal lattice they'll prevent it just simply by getting in the way and limiting the interaction of every water molecule to the neighboring water molecule and therefore these hydrogen bonds will not form as readily and so what's going to happen is the roads will, will still freeze but at a much lower temperature than previously so instead of freezing at you know 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius, it might be like negative 4 degrees um, Celsius or something like that. Okay, so it depends on what type of um, solute you're adding to the system and how good it is at interacting and preventing those water, those hydrogen bonds from forming. So, kind of the good number to remember is 4 degrees Celsius. Why is that a good number to remember? Well, if you look over here on this chart, at 4 degrees Celsius, water is at its densest state. So that means if you increase and you go above 4 degrees Celsius, the liquid water is going to want to expand as it's heated because of its molecular motion. So kind of the idea that as you give it heat past 4 degrees, all these mo water molecules are going to be bouncing around more, they're going to collide more, and so they're going to separate. But if you go less than 4 degrees, that's when you have all these formation of hydrogen bonds, they're going to start spreading out. And so 4 degrees is like the magical state that allows the water to be the most densest right at that temperature. Well, you say, whoa, why would I care? Why is that important at all? Well, because that's how we survive. If water did not have this awesome property, all of the fish would die every single year. Because think about it. If you are, you know, live out in a really cold environment and all of your fish are happy to go lucky in the summer and then the winter rolls around, and let's say it's negative 20, well, guess what? That means that if it freezes from the bottom up, because that would mean that the colder it is, the more dense it is, all of those fish would get trapped in the frozen water and they would all die. But instead, what happens is you have an ice layer form on the top, which basically insulates the rest of the body of water. So that means the most dense water, which is at four degrees, is gonna sink to the bottom, and the colder water at zero degrees is actually gonna be closer to the top closer to the ice layer. So that means that all the creature has to do is be able to survive at four degrees Celsius water and they can survive, you know, anywhere from four to zero. And so they don't have to be able to be frozen and then thaw and somehow survive that crazy process. So the fact that ice is the most dense at four degrees Celsius is what keeps our fish alive. Okay, so let me ask you this question then. What was the precise temperature at the bottom of Lake Michigan on New Year's Eve in 1901? What do you think? 
going to write it down. Tell me the exact temperature. I hope you said it was 4 degrees Celsius. So if a body of water has 4 degrees Celsius water in it, then the temperature at the bottom of that body of water is 4 degrees, for the same reason that the rocks at the bottom are 4 degrees. Both 4 degrees Celsius water and rocks are denser than water at any other temperature. If the body of water is deep, and in a region of short summers, which is the case for Lake Michigan, the water at the bottom is 4 degrees year-round. Okay, so that's why it's actually really good to swim at the top of the lake, because if you dive down too deep, it's going to get even colder. And that's another reason, too, as to why some of our oceans are extremely cold. All right. Liquid waters, and it actually can get even colder because of the fact that you have salt in it, right? Which is what we talked about previously with um, salting the roads. So just think about that for a minute. All right, additionally, not only is water awesome because of its structure allows for the formation of hydrogen bonds, which forces the crystalline state to expand, which allows water to be the most dense at four degrees, it's also very sticky. Okay, what I mean by that is cohesive and adhesive forces exist between all molecules. Cohesive forces are interactions between molecules of the same substance. So hydrogen bonding is an example of a cohesive force because it's one water molecule to another water molecule. Whereas adhesive forces are interactions between molecules of different substances. So if you throw like salt into water, adhesive would be water to that salt. Okay, so it's interactions between molecules of different substances. So whenever I think of adhesive, I think of adhere, and so the idea of something is going to stick to something else. And so that's kind of in my mind how I think of adhesive forces being of different substances, whereas cohesive are same. All right, so for instance, what are we looking at here? This is a picture of mercury. So if you threw mercury onto a table, hopefully you don't have access to mercury, stuff's not really very safe, it will actually beat up. It has some of the best cohesion out of many liquid substances. So the idea that mercury loves itself so much that it forms almost a perfect spear on top of whatever source surface you've thrown it onto. And so the idea here is, is that mercury has a stronger cohesion because it likes itself better than it likes anything else. So it's got a high cohesion and a low adhesion. Whereas here, adhesion, water is clinging to the web in this case. So the idea is you've got the individual water droplets, which is water clinging to water. So that's cohesion, but also it's clinging to the web. And so it's really wanting to adhere to something. And so this is where it's got a good cohesion and also a good adhesion is what you can kind of see here. All right, why don't you give this a try? Feel free to, to do this activity or not, but I think it was a lot of fun. So whenever we have the lecture on campus, this is what we typically will do in class. So two activities. If you want to pause it and go get these things, you're welcome to. What you would need is you just need like a piece of cardboard, a thicker piece of paper, um, like a note card works perfect, um, a paper clip, and then like two trays full of water. So you can just go get like whatever things you can find in your kitchen. And then you also need a little bit of soap. So cut out the, the piece of paper like you see up above and form it into a shape of a boat. Then if you place it onto water and kind of let it balance, if you then put a tiny little drop of soap right there in this kind of little alcove behind the boat, watch what happens. Okay, and then the other activity is if you take a, a paper clip and you try and put it on water, what's going to happen? It's going to sink. Okay, and don't put this in the same boat thing that you just put the soap in. Take a freeing, clush, fresh, clean um, pan of water and try this. Okay, so what we can do is you can actually get the paper clip to balance. How I do it is you can put it on a paper towel or a Kleenex and then just gently lower that Kleenex or paper towel down into the water and then basically your paper towel will start to sink as it fills with water and leaving the paper clip just right on the surface of the water. Then what happens when you put a drop of soap in it? Okay, What you just observed if you gave it a try is surface tension. The surface of water actually can act as an elastic film. What that means is it's almost like a rubber band 
Okay, so if you know how if you take a rubber band and you pull on it, it resists change in motion? That's what your water does. Is water likes itself so much that right here at the surface, it says if anything pushes down on me, I'm going to resist breaking. And so it forms like a trampoline. As your object depresses down on it, it resists that motion. Okay, and the reason for it is, is once again, hydrogen bonding. And so the reason you're able to get the paper clip to rest on the surface of the water is that once you laid it perfectly on the water, there was so much surface tension that the downward motion of the paper clip didn't break through. But if you just drop the paper clip from somewhere up high, that force was strong enough to penetrate the surface tension and it would go through. So once you have that paper clip resting on the surface, you add a drop of soap, you know what happens? You break the surface tension, all of the hydrogen bonding is destroyed, and your paper clip sinks. With the boat experiment, what happened is once you put a drop of soap behind it, the soap caused the water molecules to stop sticking together, and instead they started pushing away from each other. And as these water molecules pushed away from each other, the boat went along with them. And so you can actually have a soap-propelled boat. So here's kind of a couple diagrams the next two slides are. What you see here is you've got soap being this non this polar head and nonpolar tail. The idea here is, is the head, since it's polar, it's going to interact with water because water is polar, like dissolves like. But the tail, since it's nonpolar, it has nowhere to go. It can't stick downward into the water because this tail is going to be pushed out of the water by the water molecules because like dissolves like. It's not similar to water and so it does not have an interaction with water and so it's going to push it up and out of the water because water would rather interact with itself than the tail. And so what happens is the soap gets in the way and prevents the hydrogen bonding between these, between these water molecules. So instead of now having a nice elastic surface on the, the top of the water, you just have a whole bunch of soap and a whole bunch of other water molecules, but not a lot of interaction between the water molecules, which what was that called again? Cohesion. Okay, so surface tension is really a good example of cohesion. All right, so kind of here's a good way to look at it. So with water, you have all these wonderful hydrogen bonds, sort of like what you see in these funny looking molecules where they're holding each other's feet. Whenever you have detergent, it's like a crazy kid just came in and as a cyclone just destroyed as many bonds as he could. He's like a crazy kid wreaking, wreaking havoc in the classroom. Okay, he just destroyed the surface tension. So with the boat, he went in just spinning, throwing the water molecules every which way, and as he pushed the water molecules away, pushed the boat along with it. Okay, here's a great just kind of picture. I just love how you can just see the elastic film of the water being pushed down by the water bug. So those water bugs, their feet are just so long and their weight is evenly distributed, it allows them to walk on water. And basically to them, because their force is not so strong to penetrate the water, it's almost like a giant trampoline is what the surface of water is. And so that's surface tension. I love this picture of surface tension. What do you see here? A bubble. Why can a bubble form? It's made out of soap, right? I thought soap ruined surface tension. But yet it's so much soap bonding to soap that it has its own surface tension. And then when you pop it, you can actually see the surface tension breaking molecule by molecule. And so that's what's going on here is the bubble is getting popped and the camera is capturing it at midair. And so you can actually see that the point at which your finger pops the bubble, that's where everything no longer can see each other. And so as it just sort of is a chain reaction, because once they were all happy connected to each other, and now they're not anymore. So that's surface tension. The last one is capillary action. So capillary action is really a combination of both adhesion and cohesion because the water has to like itself, but then it also has to like the tube around it. So if you notice here, we've got curved surfaces in all of these tubes, and they're all going downward, so they're all concave. If you were to have a capillary that looks like this, and this is your liquid, this would still be capillary action, but it would be a different example of it. 
So with capillary action, you have adhesion and cohesion. With an example like this one I just drew, that would be like mercury, where it likes itself more than it likes the walls of its container, whereas water likes itself less than it likes the walls of the container. So that's why it kind of creeps up the side, is because it says, ooh, I found glass I can stick to. And so it kind of starts creeping up the side. And as it creeps up the side, that's your capillary action. And so the thinner the tube, the more it can creep up the side, the more adhesion it can have. And so that's where you've got this interaction is what forces the behavior of the, the liquid up the tube. And so that's where capillary action comes from. The smaller the capillary, the greater the capillary action. So the amount of rise of liquid depends on the width of the tubing. And that curved surface I was telling you about is the meniscus. So even if it's concave or convex, it's going to be your meniscus, either at the top or at the bottom. Okay, and that's how you guys should be reading all of your um, graduated cylinders, all your burettes, all of that stuff is read by looking at the meniscus. So mercury is an example of strong cohesion because it likes itself better than the walls of its container. And water is an example of strong adhesion where it actually likes the walls of the capillary better than itself. All right, so here's a good experiment to see capillary action in action. So what you see here is carnations, and then we've got just water in a, in a, in a vase of some sort with food dye. And so it's really cool, and if you haven't done this, a lot of people do this in like, you know, elementary school or whatever, you can just dip your carnations into it, and you come back in a couple days, and guess what color your flowers will be? Blue. So here's some of the pretty artwork that's been made with them. So I just love the roses in the bottom. And so it's kind of example is shown down here where if you split the root into four different colors, into four different cups, it'll pull all of them up and you'll be able to see the capillary action take place. So kind of a fun chemistry at home experiment if you wanted to. So to recap, Water is densest at 4 degrees Celsius. Crystalline structure of ice contains many open space. So remember this is where we drew that lattice and all these open spaces in the crystalline form of, of water is what makes ice less dense than 4 degrees Celsius water. And then solutes disturb hydrogen bonds and prevent freezing of water, so that's what happens when we salt our roads. Cohesion and adhesion describe many natural interactions. Capillary action is a result of these forces. And so many of the things that you'll just observe in nature are due to cohesion and adhesion. And then surface tension is also just an example of these cohesive and adhesive forces. And then soap can break the surface tension of water.